thank you for hanging out and um, being here in my, my presentation. Thank you very much. And if you have been in the previous presentation in that track, that was about the DuckDB. I see the presenter is here. It was a great talk about the state of the art of databases. Now, I would like to take one step back or one step higher and not look at databases, but at whole data architectures, and in particular, big data architectures. And here on the conference, you heard uh, a lot about the different use cases, uh, machine learning, AI, Gen AI, etc. The, the foundation to do that in your organization actually is, is a big data architecture because you need data to do that. You train your models, you infer it, you use them. You need an architecture to manage that data. And this is exactly what my talk is about. Um, at the end of the talk, it would be great if you are thinking about or building a big data architecture in your organization, if you have a bit more of a, of a background, what kind of data architectures exist, what is the state of the art, and what might be applicable or would be good uh, in, in your case. If you get a little bit out of this, out of my talk, I would be very happy. So let's um, dive into that. My name is uh, Christoph. Um, yeah, I made my PhD in machine learning. It's a long time ago, but uh, the mathematics actually 20 years, 30 years ago was exactly the same. We already used the gradient descent. The, probably you know this, uh, backpropagation, right? Just the, the number of neurons and the data, of course, was much smaller. Um, and it's amazing if you see today with the same mathematics what, what you can achieve with the models if you just add more, more units and, and neurons and, and data, of course. Um, then I, I went into the industry, a couple different jobs. I worked for SAP quite some time. Um, I, I worked for uh, Capgemini in the consulting space. Uh, then I joined uh, ThoughtWorks. I worked together with uh, Zamak Dagani. We will later hear about her. She has um, come up with the idea and invented Data Mesh, and that is, of course, an important uh, big data architecture. We will talk about that. And since uh, two years, I'm a um, senior manager for professional services at Databricks. And with my team of consultants and, ar and architects, we are helping customers to build big data architectures based on the Databricks products. So how would my, is my, my talk looking today? Um, yeah, let's, let's start. Why are we talking about big data architectures? What's different between big data architectures and, and IT uh, or software architecture, right? And, and anyway, what is big data anyway? Um, then let's have a very, very short look backwards how the field evolved over the, the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years. But then the main part is let's look into different big data architectures. Um, so a common topic um, or a schema is the modern data stack. Uh, that is kind of the state of the art of a cloud-based big data architecture. And two, I will then dive into two uh, particular cases of this. One is the data lake house, and I will explain what this is. Um, and the other one is the data mesh. And then giving you pros and cons of these architectures to give you some, some, some guidelines if you want to dive in uh, also for your, your um, situation in your organization. At the end, let's look into the future. What will the future bring? What are the actual developments uh, in this field? What is coming? And you probably guess this, AI will be an important topic also here. Let's look into that. And at the end, there's just one slide uh, as, a, as a summary what you should get uh, out of this presentation. OK, why big data? I mean, that is kind of a no-brainer. Um, uh, Data-driven companies are just more successful. And this, I think everybody knows, plenty of, of reports, analysts about that. Uh, all the companies try to do this, uh, doing their decisions, their business processes based on data. Data is increasing, and so you need a, an architecture to manage that data. Anyway, what is big data? Is there a limit uh, above that limit or threshold? We, to we talk about big data, and below this, it's, it's just data. That doesn't make sense, right? And it's anyway changing over time and with technology. I actually like the, the, the definition of James Serra. I don't know if you know him. He's a system architect uh, at Microsoft. And he just recently, a couple of months ago, uh, released a book uh, on O'Reilly, Deciphering Data Architectures, really a book I can recommend. And he very simply says, a hey, big data basically means all kind of data. Yeah? And if you look backwards 20 years ago, Data basically was tabular data, right? Data in, in tables, in databases, in spreadsheets. And now we have very different kinds of data. And this actually also causes problems in the architecture, like semi-structured data, XML, JSON, unstructured data, text, video, audio. 
Data can be in batches, but also can come in continuously in streams, right? Clicks, streams, sensors, whatever it is. And a big, big data is basically dealing with all kinds of data. So why do we need a, big data, a particular big data architecture? Um, if you look at an organization on a, on a high level, there are basically three streams going through, this, through an, any organization. One is goods, materials, maybe services as well, uh, so non-material stuff, right? A company is producing something, is generating something, is creating value with this. On the other side, you also have a flow of money and costs and value, so a financial flow, right? Uh, so things cost money, uh, you, you pay salaries, but you also, of course, have revenue, so have incoming streams of money and outgoing streams. And then the third stream is an information flow. You get information from outside, you, you get information at several points in your su uh, supply chain or your in your chain in your organization and you use this information. Um, and as you know, an, usually an ERP system, enterprise resource planning system, is managing these flows together and make sure the information is at the right place where this is needed. That is nothing new. What is now changing is that the information flow is growing bigger and bigger. And as we said, it's not only tabular data in, in relational databases, like in the good old SAP time, right? Um, it's all kind of data, it's more data, it's real-time data, it's streaming data, and ERP systems just are no longer capable of managing that. So what you, what you need is a, an extra architecture beneath this, what we call the big data architecture, to manage this uh, flow of information in your organization. And so, if we look uh, a little bit on, into a definition from that, what is a big data architecture? We can say a big data architecture must provide the right information at the right time, at the right place for persons and applications, regardless of the type and the size of the data. So there's a lot of in this, this definition, right? Providing the right data at the right place is, is important, but also not only for persons in a UI, an analytical uh, user interface, but also in, in form of an API for, for other applications to use that data. And it should work regardless of the, of the size of the data, so it should be really scalable, and also regardless of the type of the data, as we said, right? Not only not just structured, but also unstructured in all kinds of data. And if you go a little bit more in, in detail, what are the requirements for an architecture here? As we said, unlimited storage, so at least theoretically, right? You do not want to come to a limit and say, okay, my architecture now is full. I have to delete data or I have to stop working. Unlimited data also means unlimited compute to work with this data, to, to mangle the data, to run analytics for this data. Um, as we said, capable to work with all different kinds of data and also to support all kinds of use cases, right? Not only analytics use cases, but for example, machine learning, uh, Gen AI, this kind of stuff, streaming data, batch data, etc. And then providing this in the information via UI or API. Uh, and then more from a business perspective, requirements, uh, of course, data must be trustworthy, single source of truth, right? People, users have to trust the data, that's very important. Um, data must be discoverable. You know all data lakes and you, you don't know exactly where stuff is. It becomes a data swamp. As we say, nobody finds data anymore and then it's completely useless. So you need something like a data catalog, for example, or really um, mechanism systems to find the right data you want to use. Um, you will uh, define and run some data governance in your organization. Rules how to use data, who is allowed to use which data, right? What is data quality, how to measure it, who has access, how do you deal with personal data, uh, where is data coming from, data lineage, all this stuff, that is what we call the rules about this is a data governance. And it's important that your data architecture is also supporting or enforcing even these different rules of your data governance. And then even one step further, you might define your whole organization different. That is what you, for example, do if you implement data mesh, right? This has a lot of implications on your organization. You divide your data in different business domains, as an example. You define product owners for data. Um, so you change your organization, and of course the data architecture uh, has to follow this and has to be able um, to support your data organization, right? 
Um, the last point, maybe the, the most difficult, uh, but that's also not really an important part. Not only have a, have a certain group of analysts and IT people able to work data, eventually you want that everybody in your organization is able to use data, to connect data, to mangle data, to work with data, to get the right information. And that's what is called a data democratization, right? So let's have a look. Um, how we can achieve this? Before we do this, uh, just one slide, a brief history, because that makes a lot of things clear we have today. But actually, <coughs> you probably have been in the, in the keynote from, from, from um, Hannes Mühleisen, uh, Professor Hannes Mühleisen yesterday. He had a whole talk about this. So I only pick up a, a very few things. He really explained this very well if you have been in, in his keynote yesterday. And, and I'm not going to repeat this. But really, major milestones of, of, of data architecture in general is, of course, the uh, invention of the relational database model. That's what, what Hannes also said yesterday. And SQL, as we heard yesterday, it stick, stick forever. It's still around, of course. It probably will be forever. Uh, yesterday, he said it will eat up a lot of other use cases, a lot of other formats, right? So that is, was really, um, really, really important, um, is the S SQL relational database model, and then later uh, invented by IBM people, the SQL language, actually. Um, another very important milestone is the cloud, right? And that was uh, 2006 when AWS was, was founded from, from Amazon. That was the first time with S3 and, and, and compute. Uh, they, they offered computing service in the cloud. And you see or you know Google and, and Microsoft Azure closely followed to that. But that, of course, changed a lot. And if you look today where we store our data and you will see the architectures, it's everything in the cloud. So that was, was a major milestone. But another very important milestone, and it was also mentioned by Hannes and also in, in the call by, from, from DuckDB, is the, the development of massive parallel computing. Because at some point in time, even with DuckDB, you, you are, you're done in, in your single computer. You have to distribute um, uh, the compute load to, to several com computers. That was uh, first done with Map and Reduce at Google, and the, the trick is they used uh, commodity computers, so not, not big iron, specialized, expensive computers that would be vertical scaling, and of course you are at, at some point you are at, at the end of vertical scaling. At some point in time you have the biggest machine possible, and that's also the most expensive machine. So you scale horizontally, but just adding more servers. That was the idea of Map, map and Reduce, Hadoop later, and then of course Apache Spark, uh, which was uh, invent, in, invented 2009 by a group of uh, students at the University of Berkeley. And by the way, these are the founders of Databricks, and they are still today in, in, the, in the company Databricks and, and leading that company. Yeah, and today we have the modern data stack, and that's exactly where we want to dive in now. So let's look into different kinds of big data architectures. And a kind of a generic pattern of big data architectures is what we call the modern data stack. Right? And then models like the Lake House or Data Mesh, uh, Data Fabric also in some way, are kind of, of concrete versions of a um, modern data stack. So let's look at what is, what is a, a modern data stack. And if you search this, uh, these <coughs> if, you, if you search this term in the internet, you get lots of different definitions by different companies who are claiming they have tools or they have the, the modern data stack as a product. Um, I found this from Altec Soft uh, pretty nice because it really explains what it is, and, and we can read it here. Um, a modern data stack is a collection of cloud-based tools and technologies used to gather, store, process, and analyze data in a scalable, efficient, and cost-effective way. And if you read this carefully, there's a lot of stuff in this one sentence, right? It's cloud-based. Yeah? Of course, you might be able to build it on-prem, but that you would have to rebuild all the cloud services on your own. That, that doesn't only make sense maybe for governments or, or banks, whatever. Usually it doesn't make sense. So um, a, a modern data stack is cloud-based. And then what I said, it's a collection of tools and technologies. So that means it's not just from one vendor, like an SAP system. It's you have to stitch together a lot of different tools and technologies to build a modern data stack, right? Um, so this can be different tools, different vendors you, you, you put together. And we will later look at, at some architectural uh, pictures, how this can, can work. Um, then it said it's scalable. 
Yeah? So data, it's scalable in terms of the amount of data, but also scalable in the amount of compute. And this is done by, by being in the cloud, actually. right? Um, you will see in the architecture picture, it always has a data lake, right? where data is incoming and is landing before it's then transformed and, and, and worked on. And it can have a cloud-based data warehouse. And now let's look at the architecture picture of this. This is how a modern data stack would look like on, on a very abstract level. You see on the left side uh, different data sources going into this architecture. So that can be classical databases, ERP databases, right? Um, of course, uh, software as a service applications. Yeah, uh, Salesforce is an example here. Lots of other business uh, applications with APIs can send data into your uh, architecture. Uh, it can be ev streams, event streams also can go in here. Uh, and of course, un and semi-structured data like, I don't know, audio, video, text uh, from users, events, uh, sensor data, etc. This all lands in your data lake. And usually you have several layers, so three is more the minimum, what you usually have. So in a lot of cases, in practice, you usually have more even. But one where the data is landing, we call this the bronze layer, others call this in a, in a different way. So data is just landing here. And then, of course, it has to be transformed. It has to be cleaned, it has to be uh, worked on so that, that is this consist on, on consistency, naming, and, and a lot of different things. Uh, that it makes sense in a, in a business uh, term, right? It has to be merged with things like by customers, by products, by regions, whatever it is. So it's moving through these different layers. At the end, it's kind of the gold layer or the, the business ready or business relevant data where business people can work with running reports, dashboards, analytics, etc. And all this is done with the cloud compute, obviously, right? These, these kind of transformations, these are all pipelines. Um, ETL processes to, to manage this data. Um, then, you, if you have heavy, uh, you're working with, with SQL, and, and most of you do, obviously, you can have an, um, a cloud data warehouse here where these uh, business ready data is imported regularly into this uh, data warehouse and where your SQL scripts and programs are running. Um, to provide these, these, these reports uh, and these, these, these SQL scripts. And then on the right side, you have the data users who are using this data. This can be your BI applications. Yeah, Power BI is, is, a, is, a, is a common example. Uh, other UI and, or analytics tools, uh, but also APIs for other applications using that data. And of course, data science, machine learning, Gen AI tools, trainings, etc. And they can either use the data in the cloud warehouse, or they also can directly access the data in the data lake, right? And, and um, data science, machine learning usually like to work on, on, on data in, in the data lake, right? And not exporting them out of the data warehouse. Uh, at the bottom, you have supporting functions, something what you need, like the data catalog. We talked about this. User management, of course, right, for governance. A data lineage, where's the data coming from? What are the different steps? Um, data vi virtualization, if you don't have to copy it all the time. And, of course, workflows to automate all these processes. Let's look what are the, the, the pros and cons of, of this uh, modern data stack in general. On the pro side, um, yeah, it is scalable, it's cloud-based, uh, it's it basically unlimited in, in the number of data you can store here and also in, in, the, in the number of compute you need. Um, it is still cost-effective. It is usually, because it's cloud-based, uh, consumption-based pricing, so you pay what you use, right? You not buy super expensive hardware standing in, in your basement or at a, at a provider, you just pay what you use. It's pretty universal, so it works with all kind of data, right? That's no problem here, no limitations of the kind of data, and it also supports all kind of different use cases. Not only analytics, SQL, but also machine learning, streaming, and a um, Gen AI, whatever you, you, you need to, right? This is the right architecture for that. On the, on the con side, on the other side, well, it's a pretty complex architecture. So, um, as we said, it's usually a lot of tools and, and uh, cloud tools you have to stitch together. Um, you uh, need, need expertise, know-how to do that in your team or you buy this by, by consultancy, right? Not only to build it, but also to maintain it, to, to optimize it, right, continuously. Um, and one in particular is a, is a problem here or can be a problem 
This is the separation of the data warehouse and the data lake. And if I go, go back to uh, the, the previous slide, um, you see this. This can lead to problems that the data is also in the cloud data warehouse. Yeah? What is the, the, the single source of truth? It can be kind of stalled, become stalled in the data warehouse. Imagine you have stre data streams uh, running into your data lake uh, literally continuously in real time, but you have a, a, a job copying that into your warehouse maybe overnight, once a day, right? Or once a night. Then there are situations that you have outdated data in your warehouse and already a different or updated data in your data lake. And if, for example, machine learning is using both sources of data, that can you can run into problems and inconsistency. So you have to take care of this. That makes it a bit more complex. Another point is that you have to set up data governance, user access rights, and all this kind of stuff basically twice, for your data lake and for your cloud data warehouse. To prevent that, uh, a solution for this, we're coming to the data lake house, right? And I will show you in a, in a second what this means. Um, well, the name already says it. A lake house is a combination of a data lake and a data warehouse. So you, you keep your data in the data lake, and it can be used a, with the functionality of a, of a data warehouse without having an extra data warehouse, right? Everything is in your data lake, uh, and it, also the functionality of a, of a, um, of a warehouse is uh, out of the, this data lake. And I will show you in a, in a minute how this looks like. Um, that is, by the way, is a concept in, invented by Databricks uh, around 2020. Uh, we still offer this, and, uh, but also a lot of other customers are following. It's not, not only available by Databricks, it's available by a lot of other vendors, Microsoft, for example, and others uh, in, in the market here. This is really a, a common, common pattern. And two things are really important to make this work, and this is why it only came up 2020 when the technology was ready. And the first thing is, you know, a, data, a simple data lake is an object store, something like S3 or whatever, another clouds, right? And it has no tr transactional safety. That means if you copy a, a big file into your data lake or you append a file, and for whatever reason, uh, this job uh, is, is, is not working, is failing, right? Maybe you have a network error and it, it, it stops in the middle. You are in kind of an inconsistent state. Imagine a parquet file, and just part of the parquet file is copied. You don't know what actually is there, is not there. You, you are completely in an undefined state. And as we heard also from Hannes Mühlbein, if you have hundreds of servers, and you have huge data lakes, and you have a lot of copy jobs, this regularly happens. It's not, not that it happens one every thousand years, but that can happen every day. And if you don't uh, get this and, and take care of this, your, your complete data source and data lake is screwed up, and all the following um, uh, processes based on that data are also screwed up. So it's, it's very important, and that is something a database brings automatically, this kind of transactional safety, or what we call the ACID properties, right? We heard about this in the, in the previous call. Um, and so that is super important. That means if you run a transaction on your data lake, either the transaction is successful and you are in a, in a defined state, all is good, or if some kind of error occurred during the transaction, the system automatically automatically makes a rollback and then goes to the previous status before this transaction. Again, this is a consistent state, right? So always the, the system and the data is in a consistent state. Only if you, there's an error, it is rolling back and then you get an error message and then you have to handle that, maybe do it again or what, whatever you do, right? But it makes sure that your data always is in a consistent state. That's what we call transactional safety. That actually is for, for big data architectures very important. And luckily, there are software layers who can uh, provide that. These are software layers on top of an object store. And there's, for example, the, the Delta Lake from Databricks who is offering this. It's an open source uh, product. Everybody can use it. But also Apache Iceberg, uh, used by Snowflake, for example, it, is doing the same thing. Also Apache Hoodie is, is doing that. So uh, you will see this. On top of your, your data lake, you have this uh, next software layer to provide your transactional safety. That actually is very important if you want to run database functions like SQL. The other thing is important, you need performance to do this. You need a lot of compute, you know, um, doing analytics on, on the massive amounts of data, probably with hundreds of thousands of users in parallel in big organizations, it's very demanding from, from the compute side. So you have to make sure 
that uh, you have the right uh, compute power available to, to get uh, the necessary performance for your end users. And this is exactly what we said in the, in the history. This is the development of this massive parallel processing, like Spark, for example, who is able to provide that to you. So if you put then these, these um, Spark, for example, um, into your lake house, then you can run SQL scripts on your data lake. And this is exactly what the, what the lake house is doing. You see here, the architecture actually is much simpler. That, that's the beauty of the, of the lake house. Again, on the left side, you have the different data sources. And now you just have this data lake, but it's a transactional data lake, as I explained, right? You again have the different layers, like raw, transformed, business. Uh, you have this transactional data management layer in between. So every write and read to the object store, to the, to the S3 or to the data lake is going through that layer. And you have this massive parallel processing um, compute layer in your data lake, uh, which usually is Spark, um, uh, to, to provide you the right performance. Supporting functions are the same. Uh, the data usages are also the same here. Um, but you see the whole architecture simpler. You have your data in one place in your data lake, uh, not on several places, and also the administration, the um, uh, the, uh, the governments, etc., is, is only for, for your data lake or your lake house, it's, it's much simpler. So again, to uh, summarize here, as we said, it's a simpler architecture compared to the general modern data stack. All data in one data lake make data governance and metadata management much easier. Uh, of course, it can process any kind of data, and uh, that is also a good thing. Um, there are kind of out-of-the-box solutions available, not only from Databricks, also from other vendors. But for example, if I want to um, set up a lake house on Azure, Microsoft Azure from Databricks, lake house from Databricks on, on Azure, I think it's three or four clicks, and you can really try it. Uh, if you have an Azure account, uh, you go to Databricks, Lake House, and uh, you just have to define a few zones where you want to set this up, and then you click and you have at least a basis architecture. So it's, uh, it's quite easy. Of course, you have to do a lot more, and if you want to use it in production, that's clear. But it's kind of easy um, to set this up. What are the cons on this? Well, it's not really a negative thing, but this is a very technology-led approach. What is not telling you or giving you any guidance is um, what is the organizational design of your data organization. Or if you are really a huge organization and you are one data lake um, or one lake house is not enough, right? You, you need a, a distributed approach. Um, you have, I don't know, an international organization, you have different business units, and, and having just one data, uh, one lake house or one data lake would be a big bottleneck for you. Um, then you have to organize uh, not only the technology, but also your, the whole organization. Um, and, and the lake house is a more a technical solution. Of course, you can do this, but it's not helping you how you do that. And um, this is then something where another architecture comes in place, and that is the data mesh. And um, yeah, what is data mesh? Data mesh was invented by Zamak Degani. Um, she, a, a, at her time at ThoughtWorks, and I, I worked together with her. I was in a couple of projects implementing data mesh with, with our customers at my time at ThoughtWorks. And um, as I said, it's, it's more an organizational approach than really an architectural pattern. It's not a technology pattern. You will see this in a minute. It's an organizational approach. Um, very important point is that it is a pattern for a decentralized data organization, right? It's not one centralized architecture or group like like business uh, analytics team or an IT team. It's a decentralized approach and decentralized along business domains. So it's business domain driven, right? We heard a lot about business dom business uh, domain driven here on that conference, and this is here the same. Um, so you define different business domains, you define the data in these business domains, all with a, with a business angle, not a technology angle, right? You even define owners of this business data, or the, the data in the different domains. And that is the next important point, and this is really something new, I think, with this approach, is that data is treated as a product. Data is not a file, or it's bits and bytes, it's nothing just technology, it's a product, it's an internal product, and other organizations or other groups, whatever, in your organization is using your product if you're the owner, right? And this completely reverts how data have been treated in, in former times. Former times, you know, 
I own maybe the sales data or customer data, then this is really, uh, this is power for me and I won't keep it for me, right? I, I'm very careful to give it away. I would never give it freely away. And people have to ask me, can I, can I use your data? I need your data. And I would say, oh, wait a minute, and uh, it's personal data and not so easy. And um, this is exactly the other way around. I'm a product owner of some data, for example, on the customer data in our organization. And I want that everybody is using my product. I'm incentivized on this. That is my job, actually, right? And I want it in a way that it is most useful for others. So it's great quality, it's easy to use, it's, it's state of the art, it's actual, all these things, right? And I can be measured how well my product is used. And I mean, pr internal product is, is known in organizations, like IT services are products, other things, uh, I don't know, facility management, HR, all these are products in your organization. So that is working, and you use that concept also for data, right? And you have a product owner for some kind of data, and he's responsible that this data is used. And if somebody else says, hey, I can't use your data, they are, I don't know, in the wrong format, they are outdated, stalled, whatever, then the product owner is responsible for that, right? So you, you change the whole way data is, is managed in an organization. That is a great thing, but it's also very difficult, right? You have to really, it's a, it's a change management project. We're coming to that in a, in a minute. That is a, a picture out of the original paper from Zamak uh, on the Martin Fowler homepage. And you see here how this works in general. Uh, the big circle here is, is a business domain, yeah? for example, sales, whatever. Then you have different um, data products, like the customer data or product data, whatever it is, defined as a product. Uh, then you have ports, you have incoming ports, where data is coming, for example, from operational systems, ERP systems. And you also have ports where data can go out and can be connected with other data products. It's kind of a little bit like, like Lego bricks, right? Where you, you get different standardized data products, you find them in a, in a catalog, and you say, let's take the customer data, and then I take the product data, and maybe a regional data uh, from a certain region, put them together, and, and I have an, a, a report about how well I sell a product to certain customers in a certain region. Yeah? And with this data, I can build another product, right? I can provide this data now again. Now I'm the product owner, data product owner, and I can provide it to others in my organization in this, uh, in this architecture. Yeah, this is, this is the, the, the idea of, of, of the data mesh. And if you look here into the pros and cons, this is really a decentralized approach and it's in particular valuable for large organizations. That's what I see in the market. So really international organizations who have a lot of different uh, lower architects like lake houses, analytics platforms, data, data warehouses. They can connect them together and, and define a whole data mesh in their whole organization. That's just, that is what they are doing. Um, and, and the great thing is the IT or analytics team is no longer the bottleneck, right? Which might be the case in, in your organization, right? The business always goes to the analytics team and say, I need a report here, I need this, I need that. And they say, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> we still have a long list of things to do. This is a decentralized approach. You have these analytics teams in the business domains. They are responsible for their data and, and, and then their reporting and analytics needs, right? Um, and of course, this data as a product is really moving the data ownership into business domains. It's no longer in, in, the, in the analytics team or IT team where they might not really understand what this data is about. Um, it's, it's moving into the, the, uh, the business domains. Uh, the cons on this side is, um, one point is data mesh doesn't say anything about how to implement it. What is the technology? That's something you have to define in a, in a, in a project, right? How do you implement this thing? Can be a, a modern data stack, of course, uh, can be a lake house, uh, can be cloud native tools stitched together. So there are a lot of different ways actually how to build um, a data mesh. Um, there are no out of the box solutions available because of that. So that's always kind of a long and expensive project to do this. But I would say most important is the third point here. It's foremost, actually, it's a, it's a business transformation project because you are changing the organization, your data organization. Uh, so you are changing the ownership of data. You have to define the domains. You have to define product owners. And, and people changing their jobs, actually, for this, right? So you need a lot of, lot of agreement, management power, uh, consulting probably to do this. So you're really changing your organization. And I think you all know, if you're working in an organization, how difficult that is. That's way more 
difficult than, than changing technology at the end, right? So that is something to keep in mind. Um, it's, it's, at the end, it's a, it's, a, it's a business transformation project. Good. Now, um, yeah, we are good in time. Uh, let's look at the, the future of big, big data architectures. And as I said it, you guessed it, of course, AI also plays, plays an important role in, in business uh, big, big data architectures. Uh, so how this could look like. And um, the idea here is to include AI capabilities into these architectures. So you know, data is flowing through the architecture. We've seen this coming in, going out, it's transformed. So why not um, having something like a Gen AI, uh, a large language model, chatbots, whatever, inside this architecture, and then just seeing and learning and interpreting all this data coming in and out, right? Not only the data, but also the metadata. So what is, what is the schema? What is the name of the table? What kind of data is this? You can do simple statistics like average, outliners, but you also can find, okay, this is revenue, this is profit, this is cost from whatever. You, you have this data in, in your architecture, right? In, in your database scheme. And, and so the ultimate goal would be to have this AI running in a big data architecture that this architecture, this AI, is deeply understanding the organizational's data. Think about, about your brain, right? All the information you are getting, like the speech or what you see is going through your brain and also what you do is going through your brain. But your brain is understanding this, right? It's not just data and, and, and bits and bytes moving forth and back. There is an understanding and of course you, you act on that. And this is a little bit what, what, is, what is a vision for a big data architecture. It's not only moving bits and bytes around, but it's really understanding what is, what, is, what is the purpose, what's the meaning of this data. And then, of course, you have a lot of more, much more capabilities. And just let's look into three use cases very briefly. And actually, these are use cases companies uh, of these architectures uh, are working on at the moment. And some of them are already available in some reduced availability, but that's exactly what, what's happening at the moment. So one use case is that you translate, <coughs> translate natural language into SQL. Right? You know Copilot, uh, ChatGPT, they're pretty good in, in, in writing code, and of course they also can write SQL code. And if you have a Gen AI inside your modern data stack, they have more knowledge. They're not just seeing an, an input request, they have the know-how about your, your database schema. So the name of the tables, the name of the columns, and, 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 and the, the data types, and all this kind of stuff. And maybe also the history of what kind of data is coming from where, and is going where. And you can make this uh, usable for the Gen AI model, for example, with the RAG model. We heard about this yesterday, right? And, and this is then here is a simple example that, you, that, you sh that somebody says, hey, show me the, the global sales figures of our product, whatever it is, per country and in the last quarter, right? And the Gen AI can generate an SQL script out of that and can execute it actually. actually. So that the output immediately is you get a report with these this figures, right? Maybe not yet working perfectly, but, but it's very, very promising. And then we are moving very closely to data democratization. So you no longer need to know SQL uh, uh, language uh, and, and, and uh, code this in SQL. You can just ask the chatbot about this, right? And this is something companies are working on, right? Uh, another use case. A lot of customers moving from one big data base or data architecture to another, right? And you probably maybe also know examples or maybe that's happening in your organization as well. And, and think about, for example, you have an, kind of an old um, uh, data warehouse still on-prem, very expensive, big irons as we heard, right? And you want to move to a modern cloud-based solution is, is one example. Lots of customers are in that. One of the tasks, which is very tedious and a lot of manual work, is to translate the different SQL dialects. Because uh, you know every database vendor and every uh, database platform vendor has kind of a different dialect of SQL. And you have to go through this and then translate from the old dialect into the new dialect. And you have thousands of SQL scripts, as, as you know, right? So that is a lot of manual work. And of course, the idea here is um, Gen AI and, and, and large language models are very good in translations. Let's train them. If we have examples from, from customers who did this, who went through this, maybe by hand, we can train a large language model on that, on, on the different dialects, and, and then automate this task. And even if it doesn't work 100% correct, if it is 80, 90% correct, that is a huge uh, saving of efforts, what, what you can achieve here. 
This is actually also what, what companies are offering for customers who are migrating from one database uh, to the other. And um, <clears throat> last one, that's also very important, and, and uh, vendors working on this, that is making the usage and the optimization of these modern data stack architectures much more simpler, right? We, we saw the different components, and uh, there are a lot of knobs you as an administrator or an owner of this platform have to tune to get the optimal performance, right? This is dependent on the size of the data. You have to choose the right cluster sizes, the right machines, uh, indexes, how do you set up your, your, your schema, lots of lots of parameters you have to optimize. And you need a lot of know-how to do this and experience. And, and these guys are difficult to find on the market. So, of course, the idea is uh, using large language models or, or, or machine learning Gen AI tools to do that. That is, for example, Databricks is doing this, others are doing this as well. Um, we are not there yet. It's not that the platform is 100% automatically uh, optimizing itself, but we are doing progress and um, making um, the administration of these architectures much, much easier. And, and, and guaranteeing that users always have the optimal performance and also the optimal um, efficiency. And, and the goal is kind of the knobless uh, architecture where there are no much knobs. So you're just, this thing is just running in, in an optimal way, right? If we really think to the end of this, that is probably the vision. And I'm, I'm sh I know we are not there yet, but that's what, what people dreaming. At the end, maybe the Gen AI is, is really running your company. Why not, right? Making these decisions. The, 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 the Gen AI has all the information. If he's sitting in your central modern data architecture, he sees all the incoming data, all the outcoming data, maybe knows the processes, process definition. Everything is digital in your company, so the, the Gen AI can access everything. At the end, can do decisions for you, maybe doing, doing the steering and, and running the company. Something like, hey, how is my company going? And, and then the, the, the Gen AI would say, oh, your company is going pretty well, but actually, and actually your revenue is this and your growth rate is that. But I see a few points which you should improve. There's a possibility here and opportunity there. Should I start actions to do this? Is, is of course an example. And nobody knows how far we are away from that. Maybe we will not be alive when this happens. Maybe it happens in the next years. Nobody knows. But definitely, we are living in very, very exciting times. If you see what, what, what progress we are doing in general with, with AI at, at the moment. And um, yeah, I think it's a great time to, be, to, 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 live, to live now. And I'm um, almost at the end of my talk. Let's just do a summarization. So four things to remember if you, if you go home, I would say. Um, you understand what is a modern data stack, right? And how, in general, how this works. That's important, and that might be a good pattern for you to look into if you want to install something in, on, on your organization. Um, in particular, the Lake House is a modern data stack that excels with simplicity and versatility, so there's a lot of advantages in that. And I really could recommend going in that direction. If you are a, a much bigger organization and you are looking into an organizational approach uh, for your whole maybe global organization, then Data Mesh is definitely something to look into this, um, to distribute your, the data ownership uh, by data products along the business lines. And last point is uh, AI is probably radically changing the functionality and the, the usage of the BDAs probably already in the next years and it will still be exciting. And therefore, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.